Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Siemens Mobility Podcast, Moving Beyond. I'm your host, Professor Sally Eves, and in today's episode, we're discussing all things passenger experience. We'll explore the role of design in transportation, especially for high-speed rail. We'll also look ahead, a time travel, if you will, to help get the perfect vision, and also deep dive on current trends and developments in the sector. And to do this, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Kutcher, who is VP of Sales and Bids for High Speed and Intercity Trains at Siemens Mobility. Welcome to the show, Tom. Good morning, Sally. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. And also, I'm delighted to welcome Christiane Balsbach, who is Managing Director and Head of Design at N Plus P Industrial Design. A very warm welcome to you too, Christiane. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Likewise, so much to talk about today. And before we get into the details, I always think it's nice to you know, get a little, little bit more information about the people behind the technology and the design, and a little personal perspective on the subject matter in hand. So maybe, Christiane, if I turn to you first, what's your favourite thing about travelling on a train compared to all other modes of transport? Well, actually, it's a very easy or quite an obvious thing. You can really walk around and that's one of the only public trans transportation systems where you're going to be able to just stand up, walk around, travel through actually the train itself, especially in high speed train. That's like a, a great thing that you can move between different areas, different well, experience parts of the whole train, for example, from public spaces to maybe standing up, having a phone call just by yourself, going to the restaurant, having a cup of coffee. You're, you're creating your own experience, just your individual one. I love that. It's much more personalised, isn't it? Different zones of activity that kind of suit you. And Tom, perhaps same question to you too. Yeah, I'm I'm a relatively tall person. So for me, there are like two aspects. First one is... Um, yeah, I have more room to sit. I can move around. So I can 100% relate to what uh, Christiane has just said. But the second, uh, the second aspect for me is that uh, when I sit on a, on a long distance train, I'm somehow in a completely relaxed state of mind. Yeah? I can concentrate, um, yeah, 100% on the things I want to do. I can either work or, or relax or, or just let the uh, landscape pass by. And uh, in other transport modes, I'm, I'm somehow always on alert and not so in a train. I love that. I think it's quite good for well-being, isn't it? You can get those few minutes back for yourself or to highly focus on something at hand as well. I totally agree, Tom. Great example there. So perhaps now we'll dive into a bit more detail about the role of design in transportation, especially on the subject area of high-speed rail. And I always think it's great to challenge assumptions. And I think we've got that a little bit around design. So although around certain high-speed trains like ICE, for example, we've got these kind of very well known as design icons, but maybe it's not something that people think about in the everyday, you know, for example, around intercity or inner city trains in the same way that we sometimes think about design and the choice and variety in cars, for example. So I'd love to answer, ask a bit of a different question, a provocative one perhaps. How satisfying can it be for a creative mind to work as a trained designer? And Christiane, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, actually, it can be very satisfying because, you know, you're creating new iconic um, sometimes archetypes for the future, which are then going to run for the next 20, 30 years. And I think that just all that can be really satisfying. You're creating an experience for the people, for all of the different passengers. And, and at the same time, you're also creating a working scenario, work, a working surrounding for the people who are working on the train. So um, that is absolutely, you know, great to shape the future by looking into these um new ways of, of public transportation. Just imagine that, for example, if you jump into a totally different sector like work, new work, every, that's, that's all around us. Now, everyone knows how um, new work has been sh changing and, and, and shaping within um, the last actually two years. And now imagine um, that this is exactly happening at this, at this time, at this period in public transportation as well. So, that's really exciting and, and, and also challenging because it's now on us to make the right decisions um, in order to shape um, the future 
of public transportation and to um, in order to create what well, we call it magic moments for the passengers, for all the different kind of passengers which are using public transportation. I love the fact that you're you know, really evolving the future here. It's such an inspirational place to be. So perhaps looking a little bit more specifically into public transportation and trains specifically, what's exactly meant by that term design? We use it all the time. It's one of those everyday words, but let's drill into perhaps the detail of that. I'm guessing it's probably not just the looks, but more a form follows function approach. So what areas and specifics must be considered? Indeed, we have to consider all areas. So design in general, we do understand is more or less a mindset and an attitude. It is a problem solving, well, solution or toolbox for whatever um, yeah, problem you do have for the future. That means that we use it really as a problem solving tool. We try to jump into, um, the passenger's shoes, try to understand their pains and gains, come up with new, um, technological, um, solutions, uh, but also, you know, jump into new service solutions, business solutions, and come up with sustainable solutions along the whole chain. That means that design in general is very often used as a term for style, and style is only one mo small little part of it. Um, the rest is more about what you just mentioned. It's about economics. It's about creating well-being areas. It's about the experience. It's about all those different levels um, so that you really feel comfortable in that surrounding and that you will be able to, well, for example, have cross-industry solutions. That means um, that, uh, for example, you do specific things on the train, you work, you relax. So in different times of the day, you have different needs and, and then you have different, well, passengers. And for all that, we need to find answers. So that is actually the challenge. So it's really quite strategic and problem solving right from the beginning. And at the very end, we need to find technical solutions, which actually fulfill the wishes and demands of all of the stakeholders, not only the passengers, but also the people who are working on the train. That's really fascinating. Thanks so much. And perhaps, Tom, I'd love to bring you now in to talk about you know, the lifetime of this, because obviously these are designs that are set to last. So how long is a typical lifetime of a train? Normally, um, the lifetime of a train can be considered around 30 years. There are possibilities to also extend that lifetime. I mean, a very good example um, for that is the ICE-1 uh, fleet in Germany. They, they've been introduced in the beginning of the 90s, so they're basically already running for, for 30 years right now. Uh, but uh, Deutsche Bahn has uh, subjected them to an ex rather extensive um, upgrade program. So now they are intended to run until... Um, uh, the beginning of the 2030s. So that means they would then yeah, exceed uh, 40 years. Um, but that is then, yeah, I would say rather the, the upper limit of a meaningful lifetime of a train. How does this process, this design process, differ for a train you know, vis a vis other modes of transportation, particularly this lifetime consideration? The key word here is um, flexibility. Um, I mean, most most efforts for future upgrades, and, and as I just brought up the example of the ICE-1 um, that really illustrates that, um, it will happen around the, the passenger-facing systems. So the, the complete interior, um, the seats, tables, uh, partitions, um, but also maybe compartments, um, electronics, the passenger information system, but also security systems, those are the, the elements which, which will likely be upgraded. And, and for us, um, a future proof design means that you can actually can change or upgrade, um, these elements with minimum effort and, and minimal downtime, um, in the future. Thank you, Tom. And Christiana, from your perspective, how do those considerations factor into your design process? Well, we, we really deep dive right from the beginning and, and it always see once, once you really design a train, then normally it is for one specific country or for one specific city. If we're talking about high speed train and it is actually reflecting also the, the, the habits and the lifestyle of a country, but also it has to reflect the brand DNA of the operator who is actually using those trains. 
And um, then, as Tom already mentioned, of course, uh, you have an existing fleet and then you have to come up with a new solution. And now the question is, how can you create l like uh, a continuous passenger experience um, along all different touch points, number one, but also along all the different fleet um, um, trains which are still existing. And so we need to really consider it um, and balance it in a, in a, in a very proper way uh, to come up with a solution which is, number one, long-lasting, but on the other hand, which is also setting new standards in the market. And um, I think it's a continuous going back and forth, jumping into the future, knowing how the future is going to look like, creating those big pictures, and then taking bits and pieces out of that whole vision and implement it into, let's say, the existing fleet and in implementing it, of course, also into the next generation. And so it's a little bit this jumping into the future, knowing how the future is going to look like, going back, understanding, you know, the past number one, but also um, knowing why the, why the, the situation is right now as it is, knowing what is what are the incremental changes and what are the disruptive changes. So if you all have this, well, this all in, in mind, you will be able to really create um, sustainable solutions for today, tomorrow and for the future. That's fantastic. And I know we'll come on to sustainability a little bit later on in terms of trends too. And Tom, perhaps if I could bring you back in to talk about kind of this, this time to design a train and how it differs depending on type. So how early do you need to start designing for the next concept and start creating that? So how many years ahead are you planning for? It, it really depends um, where you start from. So, so if you basically start on a white, uh, on a white piece of paper, it, it takes about five to seven years to um, design a train and bring it into service. Um, but if you modify or, or customize um, a vehicle based on an existing platform, um, then you rather talk about uh, two to four years um, until the start of operation, um, just as, as some very rough, rough numbers here. Perfect, Tom. I think now may be a great example to, to kind of deep dive into that time traveling that Christiana brought up in the, in the last answer, getting that perfect vision ahead for the future. I think there's a bit of foresight activity that's needed here. So a talent, almost as a fortune teller, looking ahead at kind of the evolving expectations and behaviours. And obviously things like the pandemic will have, will have changed things as well in that particular regard. So you've got to predict mid to long term, long term trends, set the tone for future design. How do you create the design that's needed? Um, perhaps to you, Christiana, Christiana first, how do you get yourself into that perspective? We use a, a method, a design thinking method to really come up and put ourselves into this mode. That normally means that we, as I was describing already, jump into the past, try to understand the past first, and then, you know, get an understanding why the situation is like this. Then we jump into totally different other fields. We try to also understand what is ongoing at the moment in other areas and sectors, like the aircraft industry, the drone industry, and so on, to really also get a good understanding about the people, their lifestyle, and also their wishes and demands. And then we take personas, specific group archetypes of um, sp special personas, and uh, then we jump into their shoes. We try to really create them um, as realistic as possible. We give them names. We try to really understand their everyday life. We try to understand what are their pains, their gains, what are their wishes and demands, what do they suffer from and what do what which kind of things really make them happy. And um, once we kind of jump and really understand one person inside out, then we kind of create empathy maps. That that is called that we really try to um, put it in three different areas. So what is the specific uh, person doing before, during and after? What is the person thinking before, during and after? And what is the person feeling before, during and after? And once we really understand that person, then we will be, will be able to come up for sp special solutions only for that persona. And if you do not one persona, but let's say 10 or 20, and if you not only have designers who are thinking um, in those personas, but also others like Tom and, and partners of Tom coming from all different areas. So you normally you need really people from, from, from the R&D, from the marketing side, from the sales side, like from 
to really create a 360 degrees view. So that's like one thing what we do. Then the other thing is we go into technology. We really do this deep dive and, and um, try to understand which kind of technologies are going to be used also in other areas. We jump into the health area, for example, because they are quite good um, regarding technologies. And then the third part would be to really understand the habits, the change, the transformation of how people live, how they do want to live in the future and how so, also how other things, other areas are going to change. And this is then helping all of us to create, well, value propositions. And from the, those value propositions, we will be able to create insights and storylines. And then this is actually the basis, the profound basis to start with the ideation process and to start with, um, you know, uh, uh, creating bits and pieces of the future, creating big pictures um, within not one solution, but many different solutions. Um, we visualize them, we kind of sketch them down, and then we discuss it jointly in a team to create, um, to really get all the input and also the feedback uh, from all the other areas. And then together, we are able to shape the future. I love the different pillars involved in that from technology to those evolving habits and also those personalized personas you were discussing there, but also that co-creation approach. That's really, really iterative. I love that. And Tom, I'd love to ask you about some of the groups of stakeholders involved, so from travellers to conductors to train drivers. All of these have to be considered in this design process. So how are you prioritizing these different demands and expectations? We are actually looking at, at different user groups and, and how uh, these user groups basically interact um, with the train, but all interact on a complete journey. And, and um, of course, we are in, in the first step, we are concentrating there on typical passengers and, and these passenger types um, yeah, can, be, can be a family or a single parent um, uh, with, with their kids, or it, it can be the, let's say, rather lower budget uh, student traveler or someone actually um, in a wheelchair. Yeah? And these personas, we basically analyze, let's say, the behavior of these personas in, in detail and prioritization will then come at a later stage. Um, Sally, you just mentioned uh, also other, let's say, important stakeholders, for instance, the people working on the train. So we also, we also um, run those people through the same process. So we are kind of trying to create a journey um, also of, of, of the train driver or the person who actually maintains the train. Um, but these, these improvements or these pain points we, we might find, um, with these personas are, of course, completely different from the ones, um, passengers might, might face, um, during their travels. Yeah? And in the end, um, for me, always this, this analysis of, of the different pain points of different user groups is, is the most important part because, the more you you basically find and, and the less you kind of combine and prioritize um, at this stage, the more, let's say, um, opportunity areas you will find later on. And, and from these opportunity areas, you can then derive yeah, potential new offerings or improvements um, to those uh, user groups. You're absolutely right. You know, people's needs and are so different, aren't they? And the ideas of a journey are different to different people in those different roles. So I think that holistic perspective you described there and then drilling down on those different journeys within, absolutely essential. And also I'd love to think a bit more about the time beyond the actual journey itself that you'd spend on the train, for example, and more the holistic view of, of journeys and trips. So from planning to arriving at a destination, how does that affect the design process? Well, we really need to think right from the beginning. So the, the booking itself and also how do I um, come and go to the station itself? Then how do I feel? What do I do at the station? How can we make an experience of a passenger outstanding? We need to think what are the things which are really interesting? So number one, it's about, for example, the passenger wants to save, wants to arrive safe at the final destination. So that's the biggest thing. Then the second one would be probably the passenger um, wants their luggage and their belongings to arrive safe. And then after that, um, all of the other interests are normally differing. So one person wants to relax. The other person wants to get to know new people. The next one wants to work. 
So we need to really um, find several solutions for, for, for exactly those things. And then once you arrive at the final destination, then um, it's not only that, that the, once the train stops and once you leave the train, that's the final destination. You really need to think right door to door. So that's, that's actually what we do, and that on a bigger scale. And Tom, you know, to what extent are direct customers, the rail operators themselves, involved in this process as well? We know that that all of our customers, um, the operators, spend really a significant effort to to analyze and and predict passenger behavior, and and they do it actually um, along um, a very similar methodology as as Christiane has described before. Um, they also have the target to to adapt and and uh, improve their service offering um, um, through this exercise. And um, interestingly, they they come to different to different answers and different conclusions, and um, that really leads to the situation. If you enter, um, let's say, different trains in different countries, uh, maybe even trains from the same family. So let's let's talk about um, the Velaro trains in Spain, or you you enter the Velaro Eurostar, or, or the ICE trains in Germany. Um, you will find different interior layouts, and you will find different facilities for the passenger a different service concept so so we know that that our customers are um yeah ex spending an extreme effort to to understand and to predict passenger behavior but they are coming to different different conclusions and and for us um i mean the the best uh, the best way forward would be to basically perform these analyzers together with our customers because through that collaboration you probably come to the to the best um, results as in many other fields. And another area that that's again something that's that's been talked about a lot at the moment is around legal standards. So how about how does this you know play in the design of trains? Thinking particularly into another area of need, so accessibility and inclusion, as well as sustainability standards as well. Now, how have these changed in recent years, and what changes are you expecting coming forward next? So maybe Christiana first on that one. So sustainability, just to start now with this one, in our opinion, is one of the key factors to really differentiate and also to create something outstanding. And I'm not talking about sustainability, just, you know, changing some material or coming up with small little pieces. I think we really need to think it bigger. That means we need to think it's sustainable um, along all different uh, points uh, regarding the value chain. And, um, of course, inclusion, as you just mentioned it, um, we as designers are talking very, very often about un inclusive design. So we have different personas, as we already mentioned it before. And also Tom was describing, um, we have a lot of silver and golden ages and probably especially silver and golden ages are suffering from, you know, needing, you know, for example, wheelchairs or other help and support. And we need to think that mobility in general is one of the most important, important needs that should be possible for all people in the world. And that means that we really need to come up with solutions which are as inclusive as possible. And that um, would actually, um, this is one of the drivers for us as designers to come up with solutions which are answering specific needs and demands for those people, for elderly people, for handicapped people, for, you know, people who can't see, for, for deaf people. But also um, just to, to say, for example, a mother with a kid who is having a, a bram, uh, which is then, of course, also a bit more complicated for, for them to enter and to leave the train, but also where, where can she put her belongings and and for example, the pram and where could she sit? So we really need to find answers for everyone. And that is the greatest challenge. Um, but this is also a great, great um, opportunity for us because we could find different solutions. We could find different areas and we would really call them, well, it's, it's kind of creating a house or a home. You know, you would have different areas for specific purposes. And this is actually what we do by looking into those personas and coming up with new solutions. And Tom, from your perspective, how is the role of legal standards affecting your, your take on this? 
Yeah, in Europe we have a we have a quite um, comfortable situation, I would say, because um, let's say the the standards we have to follow the technical standards um, they are they are all combined in a so called TSI standard, the technical standard um, for interoperability, and there is a sub standard called PRM, which stands for People um, with Reduced Mobility, and um, in in these standards. Um, or in, in this set of requirements, um, we basically find um, yeah, all the um, elements we have to consider um, technically when we design a train. So there are things in there like sufficient lighting um, all the way to the dimensioning of doors, to the size and, and equipment um, of, of uh, toilets, for instance, and all that is regulated there. Um, uh, you, you asked earlier how what, what do we expect in the future in terms of changes of, of these technical standards and um, I can only say there because I'm missing the crystal ball but I can only say that the TSI standard is, is constantly evolving um, it is it is being developed further um, by authorities but also together with let's say um, or uh, together in working groups and with parts of our industry. So, so we are part of the change and, and that standard is, is, uh, especially in the fields of, of PRM. We do not expect uh, anything disruptive, but rather an evolutionary um, development and improvement in the next years. Maybe as a final question on this particular topic area, I'd just love to think about design thinking a little bit more and similar agile methods. So, Christiana, I'd love to hear more about the role of that in your work. You touched on it earlier. It's something I'm a huge advocate of. I'd just love to bring those techniques to life. I think the design thinking is actually essential and, and absolutely needed and necessary in order to question established norms, to rethink and to come up with something which is totally blue sky and out of the box. And I think it's really right now is the time to to revolutionize um, high speed traveling. Because, I mean, if we look back now, in my opinion, the in, in the ICE 3, for example, for me was a revolution in high speed train. Um, in the, well, 1993, it was developed until 1997. Um, and that was, uh, be- it was actually happening because you really thought uh, high speed trains or the whole train within the layout, within different zones and areas. And, um, and then also the new technology kind of putting everything on the floor actually opened new perspectives. And um, that is ex- exactly what you need. You need to think, I, I just take this now as an example, because I think it's a very good example, which is showing that if you look 360 degrees and this design thinking methods, this is actually what they help us with to get a 360 view on things, to get a holistic view on things, and also to discuss with different other members which are needed to create a whole um, new uh, uh, train and not only with the designers themselves to really come up with totally new ideas and to question whatever is out there right now. And now it's the time to jump and also be powerful and brave enough to really do and create totally new concepts but and then also realize them. Because it's not that... That, that designers and also, um, you know, companies and OEMs like Siemens, Tom hasn't thought about it. But you also need to be brave enough as an operator to realize them. And right now, as we have a paradigm shift, which is ongoing, people will really accept it. Could not agree more. Expectations and behaviors have changed so much. I love the way it just brings so many voices to the table as well with design thinking. So now let's move on to a new topic area. And we have an audience question from Mark Smith, who is better known as the man in seat 61. Sally, with climate change of increasing concern, how might creative interior design help persuade people to switch from plane to train? And Tom, I'd love your thoughts on this one. I personally believe that uh, you capture today's uh, flight passengers mainly with a comparable journey time on the train. However, a well-designed train which considers all the needs of our different passenger types will definitely help to enable that transformation. And um, if you think back to your last booked out domestic flight where you're sitting in a narrow tube in the middle seat, um, 
And uh, you just think to yourself, I want to get out. When is this over? And, and we can do much better than that on a train. We can provide more individual space. Um, but also, as discussed today, um, we can also provide a customized experience to, to different user groups. And I firmly believe that if you give uh, to the people the choice by providing comparable and reliable door-to-door -door journey times, they will happily take the train. I could not agree more. And I think we've all had that experience of the middle seat as well. So yeah, absolutely. Let's reimagine that. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. And Christiana, I'd love to speak more broadly about some of the other events and causes and trends we're seeing in recent years that come to mind to you that are also leading to change in this sector as well. I wonder if you could outline some of those and how they've affected your role and your business. Well, actually, we see um, a lot of shifts which are ongoing right now making complex uh, things as simple as possible or from control to trust, especially. And this is actually a huge part now in the pandemic, if we look into the whole post-COVID solutions, um, but also if we look into autonomous driving systems, for example. And so people are really giving their control away. They need to trust again. But if you look into the pandemic thing, for example, you also you need to trust again that things are um, clean, healthy, um, and that you really feel comfortable also in the surrounding. And then actually we are moving from one single solution towards um, ecosystems, um, seamless, like we were just also discussing before, seamless mobility solutions door to door and to end. We need to work on the interfaces between those single um, parts, which are always within a whole passenger journey. And well, at the very end, it's about purpose-driven solution, what we need to provide. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. And Tom, from your perspective, what are you seeing in terms of some of these causes and trends that are affecting your role and Siemens Mobility specifically? Yeah, I see mainly um, uh, that, uh, let's say, the environment and, and also supporting boundary conditions right now. I mean, we, we see railway transport and especially high-speed rail coming back strongly to the political agendas. Um, uh, one great example for that is, is the target to double the number of mainline passengers from 2015 to 2030 in, in Germany. And, and to reach that target, you need just additional capacity, or in other words, more high-speed trains. Um, uh, when we look at the United States under the new um, Joe Biden administration, there's also a very, very strong tailwind now and um, regarding sustainable transport and also high speed. Their first plans have been revealed regarding a huge infrastructure bill to repair, um, upgrade or even renew the railway in the US. And um, I think we as Siemens Mobility, we are very well placed to help solving those problems. So what role do we see this playing for the design of new trains as well? Actually, the wish would now be that the train of the future is going to answer all my wishes and demands during all the different times of the day and of the week, um, wherever I have them alone as a, as a single traveling person, but also as a group, because just imagine that in the future, um, you know, once you travel together with your colleagues, you want to be in private and use that time without making without um, being afraid that somebody else is going to listen what you just are discussing. And all these kind of things needs to be well balanced and also needs to be considered. So this hybridity that we talk about a lot at the moment, it really matters. And Tom, I'd love to hear from yourself on that, from what, you know, your experience from, from the design perspective and what you're looking for into the future train design as well. My strong belief is that this work life and, and private life will, will further merge together. And um, Today, um, if you go on to a trip, at least um, that's how I feel about it, it is still somehow seen as an interruption. And, and that will probably change in the future. So, so if, you, if you basically travel on a train, for instance, um, that will not be seen or felt as an interruption. So you, you either use the time to work or you use the time to relax. And it's, it's about, let's say, interior design, but it's also about um, uh, connectivity. And uh, connectivity is a, is a very, very big part of all this. Absolutely. So how can the railroad develop into a more digital experience? And Tom, I think it'd be a great place to look at that question. 
Yeah, I mean, right now, um, uh, to provide good connectivity on the train, we first of all um, need a good reception along the line. And then the signal is being brought to the passenger and current trains um, use repeater technology to do that. Um, however, the next uh, Velaro generations will use um, a new type of window um, where the thermal coating uh, will be modified in a way that the radio signals can enter the train and that will definitely improve connectivity. And, and at least here in Germany, um, uh, there are also plans to upgrade the land side um, uh, with uh, 5G, let's say, infrastructure. And that will also bring um, further improvements um, or significant improvements uh, on our trains regarding connectivity. So I think in a really in the midterm, you will have a, um, yeah, you will have a very, very high uh, bandwidth on, on the train. And then you could, you'll be able to do everything to, to basically log into your, into your work, um, or watch movies or stream something that will all be possible. I'm 100% convinced of that. Technology is already there and, and just needs to be implemented. And so apart from that, obviously we've got mobility and work crossing together. Are there any other cross industry solutions that we have to take into account in terms of these developments and the design? So Christiane, I'd love to hear your thoughts. We have many, many different uh, cross-industry or crossing aspects which needs to be considered and where we need to find solutions. And maybe in the future, um, people will really will, will kind of walk through the different zones. Because right now, once you travel, once you use a high-speed train, you just have like one seat and maybe you kind of walk around, you use the bathroom, you go to the restaurant, but maybe in the future you will walk through the zones and really experience those zones um, depending on whatever you want to do. So once we had the idea to really get rid of, for example, the classes for the future and only come up with zones, because classes is like one thing, but in the future it's going to be really more about those crossing aspects like you just mentioned and this is even more important once I work maybe I need more space and so it's kind of a combination of giving them more space in the working surrounding but also once I work some people you know they they need a laptop other people they would need maybe a telephone booth or other things um, others would need a conference room because they're not working in the train alone Absolutely. That, that flexibility so came to the fore there and almost this configurability of different journeys that, that work for everyone, but you can make bespoke to you and your needs. And maybe just focusing a little bit more around some other developments. So what do you think about this discussion, particularly in Europe that we're having at the moment about night trains and the role they can play in planning? And what happens there in terms of design? Is this a conceptual redesign around sleeping compartments, for example, or will things just look a bit more modern? How far do we go to, to make that a reality? Um, perhaps for you, Tom, first. You're touching also on the um, on the question of design and of layout of of these um, of these coaches, and um, your question probably relates to the fact that that the the pro yeah mostly private operators who are in that in that market right now they they bought existing coaches um, in many cases from those national operators. Um, uh, and, and then they refurbish those, those coaches. Yeah. And uh, therefore we see a lot of, let's say, more traditional layouts, um, and designs, let's say, um, in the current offerings. However, there are also other examples, um, ÖBB, um, Austrian railways, they, they, they ordered, um, new night jet uh, vehicles from Siemens and, and those will already feature new layout options. There will be so-called mini suits in there for, for single travelers, um, which then can be cleverly connected, um, for instance, by couples. And, and some of the previous pain points were also addressed. You can, you can, yeah, change the temperature individually for your, for your, let's say, sleeping compartment. There will be family compartments and even luxury compartments with, with individual toilets and, and showers. Yeah? And I believe if more night coaches are being newly ordered, then we will also see more clever and smart layouts, um, which then probably will increase capacity and individual comfort for the traveler at the same time. I think what Tom was just mentioning is exactly the direction what we are also pushing from our side. Um, we want to break the rules first to really create, in order to create totally new layouts, which will then um, attract people 
to really use those night trains. And maybe the first thing what we need to do is to get rid of the name night train because automatically we have the existing ones in our hats. And if we want to do something new, then we need to break those rules or we, we get, we need to get rid of the name first. So we call it hotel on rail. Um, because this is actually opening now many different new solutions. It's about really creating uh, as much privacy as possible, even in an open coach and um, creating an atmosphere where people feel comfortable, where they would love to travel from one end to the other. And I think we also need to uh, come up with totally new layouts. Absolutely. I love that. Hotel on rail. You also kind of just touched towards the end around open plan as well. And obviously we've seen these carriages becoming increasingly popular in recent decades as well. And I wondered what your thoughts were, you know, on whether this is an irreversible trend or there are considerations. You mentioned privacy, for, ex for example, to return to kind of the good old days of the, of the old traditional compartments. It's quite clear the, the open plan layout, um, it provides more capacity. It, uh, you have more luggage options um, and, and you also have a higher luggage capacity there. Um, you also will realize probably faster dwell times um, um, as it is um, intended. And, and some passengers actually have a more secure feeling because you're not somehow segregated into a, some dark corner. Um, on the other hand, yeah, compartments, they have, you know, you have more privacy. Um, they are, they are better for traveling in small groups of families. They're less noisy. So, so you have pros and cons, um, let's say for both layout options. And I also heavily believe that, um, there will be probably a mix in the future and that the passenger can choose where he wants to sit. And, um, and also the, the, the size and the shape of the compartments uh, might change. I mean, in our Belarus in Turkey, we have, um, uh, some really clever business compartments with four seats uh, in each. Um, but these are not completely closed off. They are, they're kind of open, um, um, around the seating area. So you kind of already have this combination of being in a compartment and, in, and at the same time in an open space. And I think one other point maybe we could draw on now, just as we start to bring our discussion to a close, is you know we've we've established through through our conversation today that you know this is a long term strategy and development in terms of train train design. It's a long life cycle here, but obviously we've had events that no one could have anticipated, like the pandemic, as an example. So how do sudden events like that affect planning and expectations for future generations of train? You know, do they stall things, or do they have only a limited influence because of that long term nature of the project? I'd love to hear a bit more about that kind of perspective. And um, perhaps to you first, Tom. Yeah, that's a, that's a real interesting question. And um, you can divide it somehow into a technical aspect, but also a behavior aspect. I mean, of course, our engineers are looking now at, you know, corona-proof solutions like higher turn rates of, of air conditioning systems, like automatic disinfection options. Or, or even new surfaces which are easier to clean or, or completely hands-free sanitary system and so on. Um, but I think the fact of the matter is, is also that the behavior of people have changed. And, and you can actually see it if you go to the supermarket today. Um, when you get in line there today, you probably do it a little bit differently than you would have done it like two years ago. And, and there seems to be a new appreciation of distance, um, of privacy, and I will, uh, yeah, I'm convinced that this will change um, the way we travel and it will also ultimately change the interior of the trains. Absolutely. And Christiana, what, what are you seeing in that respect? I would absolutely agree what what Tom was just explaining. This thing that I really want trustfulness um, in general, because I'm giving the control away for now. And um, this is even more needed as the behavior of the people is changing in a way that um, that this trust needs to be actually developed and elaborated again, because now they're doing it themselves. We need to make them feel comfortable again. And the comfortable feeling is different from the, the way we felt comfortable two or three years ago. And this needs to be considered. And I think this is not going to change in the future. Absolutely. 
let's go for a personal question just just to round off the conversation. So what is your favourite seat when you're travelling on the train? So compartment, window, aisle, etc., or restaurant, of course, or some of the other zones that we've alluded to. And what innovation would you like to introduce to trains if you just had one wish? Oh, that's a tough one, actually. So I am always seated at the on the row um, or at the row. Um, because I really like to stand up whenever I have the feeling I need to stand up when I want to do um, a telephone call or if I want to go and, and just grab a, a, a coffee or if I just want to think. And sometimes for me, walking around is helping while thinking. Um, so the row seat is actually the seat um, I'm always sitting at. And what do I wish? I want to have more privacy. I want to increase the distance to the neighbor who I maybe not know. And um, I want to be more just by myself in the train. So I would need um, a, a seat which is more or less uh, giving more me more a feeling of a cocooning. Um, so that this is my private space and private area. This could, for example, be just by a different shape and also giving me the flexibility of um, being able to sit in many different ways, but not just one way. Yeah, I mean, I have only one wish. Unfortunately, I have many more in my head, but I hand over to Tom. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. Uh, for me, it's a little bit different. Um, I uh, love to sit at the window because I just like to let the landscape uh, pass by. Um, however, I'm most of the times when I'm um, on a train, I'm also working, so I, I normally um, choose a seat um, which has a fixed uh, table. So not just the the table you can fall down um, from the from the seat in front of you, but but which has a fixed table there. Um, yeah, uh, looking into the future and and and, and my wish uh, for that, yeah, I would also um, like to sit in a smaller compartment, not like a single compartment. So I'm absolutely fine if that would be like a four seat compartment, and and this compartment needs to have, um, let's say, uh, yeah, the facilities um, um, I need for working. So I want to have a table. Um, uh, I want to have, let's say, the possibilities to to read, um, to connect my 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 devices. I need um, 100 connectivity, and I want to have a big window so I can let the landscape uh, landscape pass by. <laughs> I love that. And I think I'm going to be cheeky and go for a hybrid answer in terms of a combination of the two. So I would go for aisle seat at a table with a big window um, to do writing more than anything else. I get a lot of uh, my book written on, on train journeys and things like that. And in terms of my innovation, I would do something about like air quality because we spend about 90% of our time indoors, whether that's in buildings or on trains, for example. But we focus a lot about outdoor pollution. So something that's around that internal air quality, I think, could be a really amazing innovation to look at. So thank you so much, both Tom and Christiana, for your time today. It's been a fantastic discussion, a real deep dive. And that word I mentioned earlier around changing the narrative on the future of travel, I think we've very much done that. You know, from the role of design to that time traveling to future innovation and going back to go ahead. And so many deep dives there on current trends and developments from technology to changing expectations and behaviors as well. And I'm truly excited about where we're going and the trajectory ahead. You know, there's benefits for sustainability, but also for experience have really come to the fore. So thank you both, Tom and Christiana, for your time. It's been a pleasure to speak to you both. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. It was really great to deep dive and further discuss. <laughs>